I'm sorry, I didn't get that piece. Sorry, uh, in your speech you talked about universities in general, but my question is about uh, First Nation educational institutions. So what ch specific challenges do you think they face, and what future, in your opinion, they have? Well, I can't comment about the, the university here, the First Nations University, because I know, I know 10 years ago it was in chaos. Um, but I gather things are much improved, and that's another thing. But I can't comment on the institution as a whole. Well, what, what, I, what I can say is the obvious, which is, you know, <clears throat> such a big complicated subject. I'd simply say that the educational uh, achievements of Aboriginal people at every level, at every level, not, not the universities necessarily, but in high school, uh, is absolutely critical for them, and it's absolutely critical for us. The whole society is going to be us. Uh, how that gets done is a very big challenge. It's a vexing challenge. And, and the interesting question is, <clears throat> should Aboriginal education be done in the, as, as, as part of the wider education system? So should there be an integration with the rest? Or should it be a separate and parallel system run by Aboriginals with a wide degree of autonomy over the curriculum that they teach? That is, at the moment, the, shall we say, preferred model by Aboriginal leaders at the high school level and at the elementary school level. Aboriginal population. 
populations um, in better shape in every respect than it is at the moment. That is this province's and Manitoba's longest, long-term and most serious problem. And I had the privilege some months ago of um, chairing an all-day conference um, by the Manitoba Business Council about Manitoba's next 15 years. And many speakers. We had a dinner the night before. Paul Martin came because he has an educational initiative. And almost every speaker from the business world or elsewhere put their finger on that as Manitoba's number one challenge. Easy to talk about, very hard to do. Yes, I was just going to ask you, what would be the one or two or three things that you would recommend to improve the undergraduate experience? You have to get more teachers in the classroom. I'm sorry, this is a mathematical thing that goes on here. You have to get more. You have to privilege teaching for a whole variety of reasons in North America. This is not a Saskatchewan thing. Over a long period of time now, research has driven promotion and tenure for professors. And teaching is sometimes relevant and often not relevant. And unless teaching is valorized and legitimated and rewarded uh, against this push in North America, um, then we're not going to have as many professors in the classroom as we did before. And I'm being blunt about it. We have to get more professors in the classroom. Uh, that's number one. And how to do it? I personally am in favor. We could not get this through our union at the University of Ottawa, although half the universities in Ontario now have it, which are teaching only tenure track positions. Because I've said very bluntly to some of my professor friends, if you people won't spend more time in the classroom, we're going to make it happen, and we're going to make it happen this way. You're not going to like it, maybe, but this is an urgent priority. I'm not I'm tired of universities cramming four and five and six hundred students in the classrooms. <coughs> that isn't going to cut it anymore for me. Secondly, we have to figure out how to have a kind of hybrid teaching model so that professors don't come in the class and repeat the same lecture that they've given 50 times before or five times before, whatever it is, to 300 or 200 people in the class. That's an old pedagogical model. That stuff can all be online. The students can read it at home, at their leisure, and come to class having absorbed that information. Technology gives us the chance to do that in a way that we couldn't tell them to read a textbook. Okay, but in terms of the professor stuff, they can all absorb that before they get into the classroom. So that changes the nature of the pedagogical experience inside the classroom. And that is the hybrid model, which I think all universities should seriously about moving forward. So those are two things that I would do right away. Well, yes. I was just going to ask what your opinion is of the future of the role of uh, liberal arts and sciences. Well, as I said, I think it's central to any university. I mean, it always has to. If go back to the answer I gave to the question of what universities are for, they are to disseminate knowledge and to pass on traditions and to engender critical thinking and the liberal arts do all of those things. Having said that, if I may say so, if your enrollments are dropping, as they are across the country in these areas, it isn't because of some conspiracy. Right? Governments, I don't think, uh, are saying to universities, close your classics department or whatever. They would be imposing budgetary cuts on the universities, and then the universities are saying, well, where is the demand? So we have to deal with the cuts, and if the demand isn't so great over there, maybe we're going to cut there instead of over there. There are probably societal issues that are causing students to be less interested in those kinds of things. And it may well be that in the liberal arts, if I can use that generic phrase, um, maybe the kind of pedagogy that's going on is turning people off. I gave the example of economics. Uh, I used to joke, we had the same number of professors we had in economics, but the enrollment went down. I said, the law of supply and demand doesn't work in the economics. <laughs> um, so, you know, obviously, this is a hard thing to do. I understand how hard it is. But maybe in the liberal arts, rather than sort of, I don't know, blaming governments or blaming some outside forces, 
You know, you should really say, well, this is a challenge. This is a big challenge now. How do we engage more students to be really interested in what we have to offer? Most of the students are undergraduates, not graduates. So most of them are interested in the highly detailed stuff that graduate students and professors are interested in. They're interested in a more broad-based approach to the subject. And so if the enrollments are declining, maybe it behooves people in the liberal arts to ask whether the way they're teaching and what they're teaching is one of the reasons why enrollments are declining. Maybe that would be something I would want to have a discussion about. Sir. You have to mention international students. And uh, if you look at most universities across Canada, they're all kind of over each other to get their hands on everyone they can find. I'm just wondering where you see international students fitting into universities, say, 15 years from now. So I'm a great believer in internationalizing universities and having students from other countries here is one way to do that because knowledge is Bounds. We live in an increasingly polyglot society. The world is more interconnected, all the ways you can think of. Um, so I think it's a good thing. I know that the universities are doing it in part because they charge more for those things than they do for ones at home. I get that. I understand that. And that may not be very laudable, but it happens to be a fact. But I think in general it's a better thing for, shall we say, our students to have the possibility to be exposed to folks from other places. And it's good for the country, if I may say so, because one hopes that some of those folks will have a good experience here and will go back to their countries with links to this country and thoughts about this country that will help us be a more global uh, country, which is what a small country like Canada very much needs to be. So for a variety of reasons, I think it's a healthy trend. There may be tipping points where um, the ratio of foreign students in particular programs may get so high that you're going to get blowbacks from governments and citizens who say, wait a minute, what about Sally and Joe who can't get into this school because 78% of the students are international? So I mean, you have to be a little bit careful about that. But, um, I'm, in the, I'm, 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 you know, these, these, these institutions are part of national and international networks. That's what research is about these days, increasingly. That's what, I'll give you something that really impressed me. When I was at Stanford, I opened up the enormous uh, course book, looking at the <clears throat> courses on offer, and they had a bunch of asterisks. And I didn't know what that meant. And I asked somebody, and they said, well, these are courses that have an international dimension to them, i.e. the material of the course has an international dimension to them. And you can't graduate from Stanford as an undergraduate until, unless you take a certain number of these courses that have an international dimension to them. And I thought, hmm, that's an interesting idea. Because Stanford, which is one of the great universities in North America, has basically said, we don't want our students to leave here with having, having some considerable exposure, I forget how many courses it had to be, to things other than, you know. So that's my answer. Was there one more, or have I that put you in your stupid? Yes.
tendency, if you go to another country, to kind of stick together because you're familiar, you know the mores and the customs of your group. By the way, here's something that I don't know whether it applies to the University of Virginia in Brazil. The government of Brazil, as a matter of national policy, decided it was going to send 75,000 students overseas to study engineering and science. 75,000. And the United States, and they wanted them to be educated in English. And we, the government of Canada, uh, and, and the provinces, this is a very, very uh, wonderful thing, uh, accepted, and somebody's going to correct me here, either 12 or 15,000 of these 75,000. And I met a few of them recently at the Brazilian Embassy. Now, I said at our university, and I had no idea what we were doing this or succeeding, I said, okay, a bunch of them chose the University of Ottawa. We have no Portuguese language capacity here, but they're here learning, but we have to make sure that they have a good experience here. And this is new for us, because we've never had an infusion of Brazilians, and this is true for other universities. Hopefully, if they have a good experience, they'll go back, and they'll become the leaders in certain domains of Brazilian business and society and government. And, uh, and, and they'll have links with Canada. They'll, they'll, they'll know a bit about Canada. They won't be strangers to it's, it's an interesting national effort that Brazilians have made. Um, they, they have basically, they, they, they've chosen their future elite in these areas by saying, you're going abroad. And our governments, to their credit, said this was in our national interest. Uh, and by the way, when they first, the Brazilians first came to us, they said, back to my friend's point, we'd like to send them, and we'd like them to pay the same fees that your domestic students do. <laughs> and the governments, provincial governments, went to the federal government and said, well, this was your bright idea to do <laughs> So you pay the difference. And the federal government said, but you run the universities, not us. We'll bring them in because we're responsible for immigration. You've got to educate them. So you have But the Brazilian government then said, okay, we'll pay the international fee. So from a financial point of view, we're happy. Thank you all very much. Thank you.